Hello and good afternoon, everybody. I'll give it one more minute. Uh, people are joining uh, and we're also streaming live on a number of platforms and we'll start in just over 30 seconds. Well, hello, everybody. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, depending where you are. I know we're streaming this live on a number of uh, platforms. Distinguished guests, colleagues, friends, ladies and gentlemen, I'm Sharif Kamel. I'm the Dean of the Business School at the American University in Cairo. And it's my sincere pleasure to welcome you to another event of our digital campaign of This Is How I Moved My Business Forward. The title the of today's event is how corporates thrive by being responsive to their community. But first, let me tell you more about the campaign and its objective, which directly relates to one of the primary focus areas of the school, and that is responsible business. Years ago, we decided to focus on three main themes, responsible business, entrepreneurship, and inclusive development. Amongst the three, most of our programs, whether degree programs, executive education, diplomas, certificates, research endeavors, community development, focus on those themes. And it's part of the strategic direction of the school moving forward. The objective of the campaign is to support and endorse a positive narrative, a buzz about corporate responsibility, highlighting successful examples of how responsible business can be embedded in both the strategic vision the objectives, as well as the day-to-day -day operation of any corporation. Another important message that the campaign promotes is that responsible business is not just a PR thing or a marketing tool, and it is not only for multinationals or international organization, but it's something that brings value and can benefit local companies as well, regardless of their industry and regardless of their size, let it be medium or small. I want to seize this opportunity to acknowledge our partners in the campaign, including the Commercial International Bank, the Coca-Cola Company, and also our most recent uh, partners, L'Oreal, Vodafone Egypt, and Hassan Alem Holding. Today's event could not have come at a better time with all the developments and challenges taking place around the world. The importance, to say the least, of the issue of sustainability and addressing it across all levels in the build-up to the challenges we're all facing as a global society when it comes to climate change. The role of governments, surely the private sector, which is our focus today, and definitely academia, is imperative to how we move forward addressing the issues related to the planet at large and where we want and how we want to live in the future. Just two days ago, Secretary John Kerry, President Biden's special envoy on climate, was at the university addressing the topic of climate change as part of the collective efforts in the buildup of COP27, which will be hosted by Egypt and Sharm el-Sheikh during the period 7 to 18 November 2022. This effort comes as a follow-up to the resolutions, the commitments, the discussions, the, 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 the projects that were put together uh, during COP26 uh, in Glasgow. There are a number of uh, activities and projects planned, but the commitment of the private sector, what are the targets, where are we today, where are we heading, how can we uh, move forward uh, uh, in the build up to having a better planet uh, 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 that we all live in uh, in the future. 
uh, today we have an invaluable contribution to our campaign through the lens of an ex extensive experience of Lord Brown in leading environmental action in the oil and gas industry. His role in Beyond Net Zero, as well as his book Connect, How Companies Succeed by Engaging Radically with Society. Now allow me to introduce our guest speaker and the moderator. It is my sincere pleasure to welcome our guest speaker for today's event, the Right Honorable Lord John Brown. Lord Brown is chairman of Beyond Net Zero, a climate growth equity venture established in partnership with General Electric. He served as group chief executive of BP from 1995 to 2007, having joined the company in 1966 as university apprentice. He led BP through a period of significant growth, diversification and transformation, including a merger with Amoco in 1998. His landmark speech at Stanford University in 1997 established BP as a global leader in the way it thought about and sought to address climate change. In 2007, Lord Brown joined Riverstone, where he was co-head of the world's largest renewable energy private equity fund until 2015. Lord Brown is an independent co-chairman of the Prime Minister's Council on Science and Technology, chairman of the, Her Majesty's Queen Elizabeth Prize for Engineering, chairman of the Francis Crick Institute, chairman of the Courtauld Institute of Art, and past president of the Royal Academy of Engineering. Welcome, Lord Brown. It is also my sincere pleasure to introduce our moderator for today, Dalia Wahman. Dalia is an entrepreneur. She's the co-founder and chairperson of CID Consulting, a management and development consulting firm working in Egypt, with also projects across the MENA region, North America, and Europe. CID Consulting is an award-winning firm that designs and implements national projects in the areas of economic and human development, including sustainability and inclusive growth. Dalia helps formulate and inform marketing and communication strategies for government entities, international organizations, multinationals, and enterprises in Egypt. She currently serves as the co-chair of the Dean Strategic Advisory Board of AUC School of Business. She also sits on the Advisory Council of the Egypt's program of the Middle East Institute in DC. Previously, she served as the Executive Vice President of the American Chamber of Commerce in Egypt. Dalia holds a master's degree in consulting and coaching for uh, change from HSC in Paris and the Said Business School at Oxford University. She is a certified management consultant of the Institute of Management Consultancy in the UK. She also has a postgraduate degree in integrated marketing communications and holds a Bachelor's of Arts from the American University in Cairo. I look forward to an insightful, informative conversation and speech by Lord Brown. Dalia, the floor is all yours. Thank you, Shree, for your kind introduction. It's a pleasure to be serving on the advisory board of the School of Business at the American University in Cairo. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you with us today, Lord Brown. It's a real honor to be moderating this session. Just before starting the session uh, quickly, I would like to uh, introduce the campaign and a short video on the campaign about how I moved my business forward that's initiated by the School of Business. Uh, as this is an important topic to call on all the companies in Egypt to showcase their uh, responsibilities and how they help to advance uh, and take actions related to environment or to society or to uh, the communities they are relevant and they're working within. So uh, it's very important to note as well, there's a little literature that has been captured to date on this topic in Egypt, unfortunately. So this um, campaign helps us to uh, crowdsource such uh, initiatives and help us to uh, get uh, insights about the good business that's being around us in Egypt and uh, to showcase the actions that are on the ground for such important sustainability uh, initiatives. Um, it's important to note that uh, there will be a celebration for the winner uh, like at the closing ceremony, and it will the winner will be uh, the, the winning companies will be uh, exposed at the Business Forward, one of the key digital platforms for the School of Business of the AUC. So maybe let's share with you just a short video on uh, on this campaign to help you understand more about it as it's closing soon.
So um, it's a pleasure to have you here, Lord Brown. And uh, we're all looking forward to your note and uh, speaking remarks. I would encourage all the audience, please, to write their questions on the Q&A box, please. We will be uh, taking your questions after Lord Brown's uh, remarks. So if you can kindly write them on the Q&A chat. Thank you very much. Lord Brown, the floor is yours. So thank you, Dahlia. Uh, I have very fond memories of my visits to Cairo and many other places in Egypt. And I really look forward to returning later this year for COP27. And I hope I'll be able to visit your campus in person. But in the meantime, it's good to be with you virtually. Thank you for the invitation to speak about the important relationship between business and society. Now, business is the engine of human progress, but that engine doesn't always run smoothly. Ever since the exploits of the Chinese salt barons of the ancient Han dynasty, societies had a difficult relationship with business, leading to cycles of suspicion and mistrust. Some business leaders are content to let these cycles play out, believing that trust always returns. But the evidence shows that the failure to change this pattern is hugely damaging for both the companies themselves and for wider society. Examples are plenty, particularly in my home country of the UK. At its heyday in the 18th century, the world's first multinational, the East India Company, accounted for more than half the world's trade. It deployed a private army of more than 250,000 to rule over its subjects, who numbered roughly one-fifth of the world's population. Successive generations of British men used the company to loot India of its riches to fund lavish lifestyles. Under the leadership of Clive of India, the company stockpiled food in the face of a famine which wiped out one third of the inhabitants of Bengal. This business model of brazen exploitation worked well for over 250 years, but in the end, its irresponsible behavior was the cause of its own downfall. The legacy of that period and the ill will it created still shapes geopolitical and societal relationships even today. Trust between business and society matters for a number of reasons. First, it bolsters relationships when the inevitable happens, failure. All companies fail in some way at some stage. Failures can take the form of poor, performance, for poor financial performance, the wrong strategy, corruption, corporate tax evasion, or unfair employee pay high impact tax minimization schemes, however legal, have gnawed away at the sustainability of Facebook and others. Banks in the wake of the 2008 financial crisis were heavily criticized and severely underrated for many years. A reservoir of goodwill built up in advance has the potential to sustain a company when things go wrong. The reservoir is drawn down, but it must be replenished. Second, trust pays. In 2015, I authored the book called Connect. Research for the book showed that approximately 30% of corporate earnings could be at stake if trust breaks down with stakeholders. And actually, to illustrate the point perfectly, Two weeks after the book's uh, publication, the Volkswagen diesel emissions scandal broke and the company's share price dropped by about 30%. And third, today's technology and global communications mean that when trust breaks down, reputations can be destroyed on a global scale. People have the tools to hold companies to account in real time transparency and accountability are no longer optional. Gaining society's trust must be an outcome, an outcome of a company's fundamental business strategy. It is not something that can be confected or managed. 
Business leaders must integrate the concerns of society into all the decisions they make. And this doesn't mean agreeing with everybody all the time, but it does mean making, making rather than simply asserting your case. So the most successful example of this during my time at BP involved the island of Papua in Indonesia. It was a battleground between separatist insurgents and state-backed security forces. BP had drawn up plans to build a liquefaction plant for LNG in a fragile and remote place, which was home to several vulnerable local communities. In the broader context, local differences and armed conflict, our actions had the potential to cause serious problems. Our approach was to establish an independent advisory panel to listen, to really listen, encourage debate, examine our activities, and issue reports. And those reports were sent to all stakeholders simultaneously, without any interference, any editing from BP. The panel advised on the cultural sensitivities surrounding the relocation of two villages and made sure that the contractor did not slip on commitments to local employment as part of the construction process. This approach added credibility to BP as a company that genuinely wanted to act in everyone's best interest and thus underpinned the success of the project. I began to be encouraged to see what, that, what a new pro approach was needed when I was at the Stanford Business School in 1980. At that time, almost every business person was preoccupied with shareholder value theory, that the duty of business leaders was to make as much profit as possible for their shareholders and to look after the interests of other stakeholders only as much as the law required. It contributed to the damaging impression that companies are often or always perhaps driven by self-interest and indifferent to the needs of those around them. <clears throat> but business cannot be conducted in isolation from society, public policy, and human feelings. It's a wondrous weave of numbers and people. In 1997, I returned to Stanford as CEO of BP and became the first leader of a major oil and gas company to acknowledge the risk posed by climate change and to pledge to do something about it. This was the first attempt by any major oil company to put climate considerations at the heart of corporate strategy. Now, this was a time when corporate social responsibility, or CSR, was the tool of choice. It failed because it was almost always detached from a company's core commercial activity. In the words of one FTSE 100 chairman who I interviewed, CSR was something that companies look at for, as he said, half an hour on a Friday afternoon. It failed to help Enron, for example, a company which had an excellent record of CSR initiatives before it was ultimately uncovered as a sham. Ultimately, CSR's greatest problem was that it failed to ensure that companies operated in a trustworthy manner. The world's changed in the last 20 years. In 2000, I was part of the launch of the UN Global Compact. And this compact was operationalized in 2015 when the UN General Assembly launched the Sustain Sustainable Development Goals. And these goals range from education and zero hunger to climate action and gender equality. This shifted focus away from CSR and corporate citizenship towards considering and attempting to estimate the direct impact on society of a company's activity. And that's led to the development of the ESG frameworks now increasingly used around the world. There are many providers of ratings, apparent measures of how well a company is doing in attending to the environment, societal goals, and its own governance. 
These are more often than not assessments based on judgments rather than hard edged measurements. And this can allow companies to signal virtues rather than perform against commitments that are benchmarked against others, as you would normally expect in financial performance. So for real effectiveness, hard edged targets need to be established independently and performance assessed independently on a regular basis. Results need to be communicated to shareholders transparently, and they have to inform corporate strategy. And we mustn't lose the key point. The great performance on ESG measures can lead to a sustainable company which should perform sustainably. The environmental strand of ESG is foundational because Without a sustainable environment, humanity can't continue to live in harmonious societies or prosper in business. I'm now the chairman of Beyond Net Zero, a climate growth equity venture, which has been established in partnership with General Atlantic. And we invest in companies delivering practical solutions to the many problems of climate change, but only if those companies we invest in are prepared to set rigorous and independently verified annual science-based targets for greenhouse gases and have their performance independently measured. When astronauts return to Earth after a mission, they often, they often describe what they call the overview effect. This is the change that occurs when they see the world from above as a fragile dot a finely tuned system and a place where borders are invisible. We are all connected and equally dependent on a fragile resource. So it follows that we must all have a responsibility to prevent catastrophe. There can be no greater basis on which to form a connection between business and society. It will not be easy, but I'm optimistic that the companies of the future will part push the boundaries in their quest to deliver for the future of humanity and that they'll succeed. Thank you. Thank you, Lord Brown, for your very insightful remarks. And uh, maybe you can start with a very important question that has goes, in, I'm sure, in the mind of many of the uh, audience, which is you are one of the the most prominent business leaders in our, in, you know, like in the last decade. So it's very important that you share with us your advice to the graduates of today and those who are joining the court workforce and what kind of advice would you offer for them with your rich and a career and uh, that's full of resilience and agility and many uh, noble, you know, like, uh, Featured. So um, we'll be looking forward to hearing from you about that. Well, I always like to think that uh, uh, advice uh, should be taken lightly because circumstances always change. And the circumstances of when I was uh, beginning in business and today are, are wildly different. But I would say several points, certainly in business. I, I think when you're committed to a business and you have real conviction about what you're doing, sometimes you come across as someone who knows all the answers, knows what they want to do. And while you say to people, yes, I'm listening to you, you're not actually listening. And that's one of the most difficult things I think that business has. It's not very good at listening. Uh, and it really quite defends what it's doing the whole time as the first port of call. It's very unattractive. I think in private life, if you did that, I think very quickly you wouldn't have too many friends. So why should you do it in business life? And I think my big advice is please tune up uh, your listening skills. Please don't believe uh, that you can blame everybody for what you're doing. You can actually only blame yourself very often. Uh, and please make sure that you hold accountability for it. As you get more and more senior, just remember that it, falls on your lap, not on someone else's. And I do hate today's approach, which is uh, just to make sure that what someone told me was deputy heads must roll when they don't listen. 
but actually the boss is really not listening. So that's, I think, the most important thing. And I think the second most important thing is just to actually understand business and be good at something. Be good at something. Uh, be really expert at something and then grow branches from an expert trunk. Don't just uh, be a, a, a master of nothing. You have to be master of something. Thank you, really appreciating. I think my second question would go around, again, uh, CEOs are under a lot of pressure, no matter what we think, right? The shareholders are still putting a lot of pressure on them. Um, you always mentioned that uh, like business is the engine of growth for societies. And this is something that's, uh, um, that you always promote and how at the same time, the bad behavior of business creates problems and creates a lot of tension in, 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 in societies and, uh, and, to adopt, and they don't follow regulations a lot of times and, and this is a problem. So CEOs by default are under a lot of pressure whether we like it or not to deliver to numbers that will like again bring in investments uh, in communities. So uh, shareholders are so harsh. So how what you advise, you know, like again, what do you think about this tension and this complex problem and how can be like a super concrete actions that would be help CEOs convince the shareholders about the importance of the sustainability? So I, I think the important thing here is to, first of all, always take a wider view. CEOs have the big advantage of having tremendous people working with them and for them. They have boards of directors, great people. So, and they can actually get access to a lot of people who have a lot of wisdom around the world. So the important thing is to take what you're doing and put it in a wider context and say, how do I project it for the future? What do I actually do? Don't necessarily agree with everybody, you can't. Uh, and you have to understand that there are really tough trade-offs everywhere. This is not easy and that's why CEOs you know, get paid a bit more than anybody else and all this sort of thing, it's they actually have to make these trade-offs uh, between the long term and the short term, between, you know, a dollar back into R&D or a dollar into, in, into dividend. These are tough trade-offs. But I think the way to think about them is to step out of the company and say, how do I actually make my case to my shareholders, what do I actually do? So you have to make a case for performance, you have to make a case for growth, and you have to make a case for investment and growth. Uh, and I think you have to continue to do that. The moment you can't do that, for example, if you have a decade of bad performance, you know, will people actually believe that you'll grow? The answer is no, they won't. So you've got to have good performance, you've got to have good growth, and you've got to have a good coherent way of putting it, then I think you can avoid some of the trade-offs. I think there are some things which are not tradable. Safety, uh, the rights of individuals, uh, the uh, diversity, equality, inclusion, th these are not tradable. Uh, they are not tradable and they are givens in the value system of many great companies. Uh, and you know, if something goes wrong in that area, you've got to immediately say something's gone wrong. Uh, and I'm accountable for it. But, it, it, but you're not actually trading them off. You're not trading profit off against uh, the equality, the, the treatment of your, uh, your team. You're just not doing that. And you must never do that. A value-driven company, in other words. Um, so you're an expert in the energy sector and with background in the oil and gas and among other industries. And the oil and gas industry is under a lot of pressure now right, for the climate change, the clock is ticking, and there's an urgent need to take actions, yet the energy mix needs to be balanced, and there's a lot of, there are many ways to, to uh, like, again, manage this. So as an energy expert, what's your opinion about, and what do you see the future of the oil and gas industry considering such pressures and such urgent? Uh, uh, so I'd like to separate two things out. One is, uh, what is happening to oil and gas companies and their behavior? And secondly, actually the question of energy and the transitions that are taking place in energy. So we know that 80% uh, of the world's primary energy is created by uh, hydrocarbons today. 
and the best estimate is it, it's expected to drop to around about 70% by 2030 and drop slowly from there on. But 70% is not zero. It's quite a long transition. And there are some things which, which need hydrocarbons for a very long time. For example, uh, while we could replace uh, uh, gasoline and diesel uh, with a electric electricity uh, in electric vehicles, the question is how do we generate the electricity at the time we need it and the amount we need it. Some of that can be generated by renewable energy. There's no doubt about that. That generates about 5% of the world's energy at the moment and growing, but it's not a lot and it's intermittent. You know, we can store some of the energy, but we can't store a lot of energy. Uh, would you cover the whole of Egypt with batteries? It's not possible. Uh, so you need baseload power, and probably given what we now know today, that's going to be natural gas, a lot of natural gas, liquefied natural gas, pipeline gas, and nuclear energy. And there'll be a mix of the two. So I think my comment on this is, it takes time to transition. It would be nice if we could transition to uh, uh, all clean energy, but we can make hydrocarbons clean if we really crack this question of how to capture carbon dioxide and store it, don't let it go up into the air. Uh, and secondly, avoid all methane being leaked out of systems to do with gas. Methane is 80 times worse than carbon dioxide per unit as a as a as a, a climate change gas greenhouse gas so that's one thing uh, and i know this is it's always a very difficult message i was at cop 26 and i could see many many young people saying actually correctly we're frustrated with this just get rid of fossil fuels and it's an ideal situation but it can't be done why are they there well, I think for many, many years, the uh, oil and gas industry has been uh, rather arrogant. Uh, it's said, you know, we're here, we do things, we generate money for governments, uh, and they may or may not use them for their populations. I hope they do. Uh, we provide something that you need to drive a car. You've got to have uh, us. And so, you know, we, we're not touchable. You know, we just carry on. And, you know, P.S., we think there's plenty of time to handle climate change. I never agreed with that. I started in 97 saying the times now were accountable. But the oil industry, you're always tested by your, as it were, your weakest members. And the reputation was poor. So people are saying, OK, well, in that case, uh, we need to push you. Uh, you're in a business that we don't like. We'd like you to pay lots of dividends. We don't want you to reinvest in the business. And that's what's happening at the moment. Not reinvesting in the business means that it will shrink. Uh, and it may shrink too quickly. And I think that's what we're seeing at the moment with the price of oil. Of course, there's geopolitical tensions on top. But uh, since the amount of investment which went into oil and gas development, dropped by around half, five years to five years, the last five years to the previous five years, uh, it shows that you know, supplies are gonna be tight for a long time. So we have to transition carefully. We have to take emotion out of this, transition carefully, and then we'll get there. So net zero. Yes, thank you. Um, which brings me to the question of green financing and how this is a challenging uh, issue considering you know, like Egypt, for example, is one of the best spots in the world for solar, for uh, wind, for many things right now. We're looking at hydrogen and like Egypt is really one of the best destinations. Yet green financing and bankable projects are is not something that's... Uh, uh, easy and it's quite challenging. So, how do you see governments and policies should, you know, like again, or banks should play a role here? Sure. So, there are two things going on. One is stopping people finance non financing non green things, which is the reverse of green financing. So, banks are discouraged to uh, finance uh, hydrocarbons by having to uh, reserve a greater amount of reserves against 
loans and therefore increasing their cost to the bank enormously. So increasingly, there's a shrinking pool of finance available for the growth of oil and gas, mostly uh, outside the state sector. The state sector is very different. It can finance itself from the treasury. Green financing uh, is still in its infancy. Uh, and it does require, I think, a rethink of, you know, what is the credit quality? So I, for example, have recently been involved in an investment in sub-Sahara Africa, which doesn't require green financing, but we know we can finance it because the payment system provides for very sure payments. So the credit is high. And I think that is the issue with a lot of this is, if it relies upon multiple customers paying, can you be sure that actually it ends up as sufficient to debt service and eventually pay, even though the interest rate may be very low? So, and I think there are ways of doing that, but it requires projects to be structured in the right way. Uh, I, I do think that, uh, you know, the population, uh, people pay for energy, they want energy. And if it's convenient and better, then uh, they'll, they'll, they'll do more, you know, solar panels with a small battery in a little box for each house and paid for through, let's say, a, a system with a mobile phone so that you have to pay, otherwise you, you don't get it, um, you know, is, is a way of actually creating a very interesting possibility for financing. So there, there are plenty of things to do here. Plenty of things. I do think that some of the things need to be debated hard, you know, whether a hydro scheme is actually green if it upsets biodiversity. So that's sort of one, you know, there are lots of questions like that. But again, I think if the case can be made, uh, then the financing is there. Not enough of it yet, and it's early days, early days. Yes, and do you see a role for um small companies or uh, uh, startup or to resolve the problem of the environmental issues and because again multi the burden is on multinational. Uh, absolutely no i mean innovation is everywhere and actually mostly in smes and startups uh, the key is to find the ones which uh, go from an idea to a, a company with real revenue and a path to positive ebitda uh, around the world and that can be done especially as quite a lot of the investment for the future, not, not all of it, but a good chunk of it will be in things like, um, how, how, do you, how do you make sure that you use all the data and information to use energy efficiently, effectiveness? Effectiveness is much more important because if you've got machines to run your efficiency for you, you don't have to make choices and you can therefore become more efficient. A lot of startups are in that area. Uh, there are there are plenty of things going on, but absolutely, I do think uh, innovation occurs everywhere, but mostly in small and medium-sized enterprises. Yes, um, there's a, qu a couple of questions around how the sustainability goals uh, of companies and corporates are uh, relatively modest. They are extended over a long period of time and the clock is ticking, as we all know. It's, there's an urgent issue now, issues now. So, uh, and is it the role of the government to put uh, deadlines or stricture or the financing institutions, as you just mentioned? Or how can we unlock that? Because this is key. And uh, how can we help push this with a faster pace? Well, uh, I think uh, there needs to be some effective uh, uh, push, regulatory push, to require people to set targets and hit them uh, on a very short-term basis, you know, year by year, as opposed to in 30 years' time. You know, that's too long. Uh, and uh, I think you will change, uh, you know, in an average company in 30 years, you might have six CEOs, and in an average uh, uh, population, you know, with a four-year, five-year term, of uh, prime ministers, you might have, you know, six or seven prime ministers. So, uh, you know, people uh, people are not around to be accountable for the long term targets they set. So, I think they need to be shorter term, so that people actually think very responsibly 
about what they are setting as targets and stand to account for them. So I think that is important. I think uh, governments are beginning to set, uh, let me back up. I think the role of governments in this area is to set frameworks. It's not to actually deliver things. That's what business, private sector, private enterprise, even state enterprise delivers. But what it, what it should do is to set a framework. And part of that is incentives. So I've always believed that setting a price on carbon is very important indeed, uh, either price or taxes, so that the cost of pumping carbon into the atmosphere relies, is goes back to the person who pumps the carbon into the atmosphere. And society wins that way because what it does is to stop people pumping carbon into the atmosphere. So I think regulation is very important, is essential. And the second thing I think is that we need to make sure that when deadlines are set, they're actually practical because there's nothing worse than setting a deadline that can't be achieved. So a lot of people are saying, let's phase out um, cars or gasoline or diesel cars and have electric cars. It's a great idea. So long as one, the cars are there. Two, the charging system is there. The charging system means new cables, new power. You know, otherwise you end up with, you know, one charging station per gas station and it takes 20 minutes to charge someone up and chaos occurs. So there's a lot of uh, things to think through, a lot of things to think through. And if you think that um, you know, electric cars solve all the problems, they do as long as one, they're built in an environmentally friendly way, two, they're charged with uh, green energy, and three, someone knows how to recycle the batteries at the end of the line. But all of that can be done, it just needs to be thought through. Yes, and affordability is another issue that's important to, to speak about as well. And because the green products or sustainable products are not cheap and affordability in developing countries like ours, as well as the awareness about the importance of sustainable products or green products is quite low, right? So well, what's your advice? Surprisingly, um, products, green products, are not, I think, the problem of affordability. Uh, I think the affordability problem is primary and secondary energy sources, because that's, that's something that represents a significant portion of uh, household expenditure that has to be made, has to be made. So I think that, and people see that very visibly, so the price of natural gas, for example, has gone up enormously in Europe uh, as has, as a result, uh, the price of electricity. So people are very, very concerned. I mean, they, they, their household expenditure on this, in the case of the UK, is doubling. And so the government has to do something to intervene to, to smooth it out a bit. I take another point here. For If you want to buy a car, an automobile, and you want it made with steel, which is green, Remember, 8% of the world's CO2 comes from making steel. If you make the steel with hydrogen, it's very expensive. But actually, by the time it comes down into a car, it increased the cost of the car by 1%. So it's because the spread is so big and the energy is a proportion, not the whole, of a particular product. Uh, actually, the cost difference not in all cases, in many cases, is almost tolerable. So I think if we can get demand really being driven for carbon-free products, it's a better way of getting rid of greenhouse gases that way. So there are some things to do, you know, like agriculture, 20% of greenhouse gases in the world. There are plenty of things that can be reformed in agriculture, not least how livestock is... Uh, is husbanded, uh, which requires the land to be planted with soy and all sorts of things like this, um, and potentially even creates deforestation. Uh, can it be changed to some other form of feed? You know, can you feed with, for example, insect protein, uh, which you can generate? So there are plenty of things to think about in this area and do something about. 
which uh, don't necessarily change costs hugely for households. COP26 was under a lot of attacks about the output and what it has brought uh, to the world in terms of actions moving forward. Uh, as a business leader, as someone who has been, you know, like an activist in the world of climate change and and the actions forward, so what do you, what's your take on that? Was this? So, I, I agree. I mean, there have been some very moderate achievements in uh, COP26. COP27, I think, needs to take them much further. In my ideal course is to agree <coughs> frameworks for pricing carbon. Not globally, you can't do that, but region by region, so that we can begin to really push uh, on getting carbon out of every industrial process. I think that's really important by getting people, uh, the companies have to pay for that uh, and not necessarily passing all those costs onto the consumer. So I think that that's very important indeed. I would like to see a bigger delivery of methane, 30% is good, but 100% is achievable. I would like to see more on measurement and commitment by the business community. Uh, I really would. Uh, right now, I'd say that uh, you know, a lot of people have talked about what they're going to do, but very few measure and report what they're doing. I'd like to see much more of that occur. So I'm very much on the business side, getting business to really begin to deliver. I think there were some uh, great uh, steps taken forward on financing. They didn't all succeed, uh, not least some of the catalytic funding uh, in, the, in the developing world, which was missing. And I'd like to see some of that come back. So, but that's where I am. I have very limited, I really want to get frameworks for disincentives for producing carbon in place. Excellent, thank you. You actually addressed one of the questions as well. Uh, so what about the COP27 um, and how Sharm el-Sheikh, you know, Sharm el-Sheikh will be hosting uh, this year uh, as the city of the host city. How can Egypt as a whole benefit from such an event? What would be your advice for Egypt? Well, I, I, I'm, I think I have to be very modest. I'm sure the Egyptian government, the Egyptian people will figure out what they really want. And I'm just uh, one voice. But I, it is very important because it's a flagship event. It will put uh, Egypt on the map. I mean, it's not Egypt on the map the whole time, but it's on the map again uh, in a very contemporary way. Uh, I think there are things that Egypt can do with, a, with an enormous population. Uh, big agricultural sector, big transportation sector, big tourism sector, uh, which I hope will continue to be vibrant uh, post uh, COVID. So I, I think that uh, you know there are a lot of things that can be done or commitments to say, we're going to use green cement in building, for example. We may try and figure out how we can make green steel you know, for all the things we do. We're going to change some of the practices in agriculture. Uh, pick a few things, not many, pick a few things that really move the needle. And I think that would be remarkable. And uh, people in the world would sit up and, and say, that's important. I, I think the other thing is developing the thinking behind how all this is done. Uh, there are plenty of great thinkers in Egypt who could catalyze uh, world thinking on how to get things done. I think that's important. Measurement, management, incentives, come back to all those, those, uh, those things, which again and again need to be done sector by sector. Um, SMEs in general are always, again, uh, looking for how can they bring value into the society, you know, like they are under pressure uh, to deliver again to the PNL and, so do you think they should play, they can play a role in being a purposeful or responsible business? Absolutely. I mean, they don't have to do everything, uh, but they can certainly be uh, absolutely, and many of them are. I mean, the, nowadays, I think everybody has to deal with, uh, for example, their governance uh, in a way which makes sense, you know, to prove that they're a good company, 
uh, that they get reports right, they get finances right, they have good board of directors, but actually they think about that in societal matters, they think about diversity and inclusion and equality. These are really important things that attracts great staff, it allows them to keep them, and it doesn't matter how small an organization you are, you have to do that. And on environment, maybe you can't move the needle, not like a great big company, uh, but you can do some things uh, like, for example, recycle your waste. Uh, think about that. Use less resources. Uh, use less water if you have a process with water. Uh, use less electricity. Think about intelligent ways of reducing, actually reducing your cost base and increasing your profit margin by doing the right thing. So I think there are plenty of things that people can do. They just need to express it in the right way. As I'm sure any SME would say, I need great people, I need a reduced cost base. And actually by, by great people means I've got a great societal approach uh, and cost base means I'm actually conserving resources, which is great for the environment. Yes, thank you. So we have Egypt hosts a number of multinational companies uh, that are operating in Egypt and BP is one of them among others. Uh, do you think the um, sustainability uh, targets and the environment and social responsibility strategy of any multinational company should be driven by headquarters or should be developed according to the local context? I have um, a very... <laughs> Uh, perhaps a slightly biased view of this. I, I firmly believe in decentralized decision-making and policy. I really do. How you can possibly think about what is right, sitting in Riyadh and controlling a company, let's say in, in Egypt or sitting in Paris and controlling a company, let's say in, uh, I don't know, in Ho Chi Minh City. Uh, how can you possibly do that? Your role is to attract and retain the very best leadership you can get in the country and the very best staff you can get in the country. And you really need to set up everything to do that and then let them uh, do what they need, what they must do uh, to be the best in the country. And I use the word best, best, best the whole time because that's what you've got to do. I would like to invite Dr. Abir uh, from the business school to unmute herself and present her question to us. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, now, uh, companies uh, are eager to uh, be socially responsible when uh, consumers are aware about the importance of a clean environment. Now, in most developing countries, this is not the case. Consumers are not very much aware of the environment. So what do you think would be a source of pressure from where should it come uh, other than consumers to put pressure on companies to be socially responsible when it comes to the environment? So there, there are three real forces which apply everywhere. One is the government you know, having a, a body of law and regulation that they're prepared to actually apply. Secondly is investors who tend to be uh, global anyway, or they certainly see the world and they say, we'd actually want a better company. And if we're sustainable, it can probably work better, be more profitable, uh, which I, is the second, I think. Uh, and, and the third is, the, as you say, the consumers who eventually get it. And they'd say, well, actually, we would like something which is a bit better uh, and uh, a bit more sustainable. So, and the fourth, actually, I think there is a fourth constituency, and that is inside a company, uh, I think the staff like to be proud about what the company is doing. And if they're listened to, uh, they get change made. They really do. Uh, I think, again, you know, in today's terms, uh, you know, getting great people working in a company, uh, you need to have a company that is right internally. Uh, Professor Blair, I would invite you to unmute yourself as well and present your question. Uh, Lord Brighton, thank you very much for your comments today. I'd like to ask you, uh, my background in the city, but I'm a very proud professor at AUC. And um, my concern 
looking at sustainability is that many companies are sort of dragging their feet in terms of action. And my concern is that governments may have to intervene to impose regulations um, or, and give time limits for change. Do you think that's likely or, or not? Thanks. So I, I agree. A, a lot of people are saying one thing and doing another, which is very annoying. Uh, such things as greenwashing, for example, is, is, is reasonably frequent, and that's not good. So I do think that uh, making companies stand by the statements they make as if they are financial forecasts is very important, point one. Point two, so I think we use body of existing law to do that. Point two, as I've said again and again, I think governments have to set the right incentive and regulatory structure to make all this work without actually doing it themselves. Uh, and thirdly, you know, it is uh, one of the constituents, uh, the NGOs, who can say, foul, you know, you've done, you've said one thing and done another, and they are witnesses uh, to the activities of companies, uh, and they shouldn't hold back. At least they didn't when I was running BP, that's for sure. Um, one last question, uh, a couple of last questions, actually. Uh, one uh, is around the, uh, the role of the government and policymakers in, in promoting sustainability. I remember you always mentioned regulation, and this is the, the, the role of the government is always to put regulations. But Africa, for example, is a very uh, poor continent. Egypt will be representing Africa in COP27. There's a lot of pressure on uh, like again uh, putting pressure on the revenues of such uh, you know tax incentives putting tax incentives among others to promote uh, sus uh, sustainable business so what is your opinion on that so my, my opinion is is first of all it cannot be generically considered i think every country has some things it can do some things it can't do and doing some things is better than doing nothing so everybody needs to be encouraged to ask them, what can they actually do? What can they actually do? It is unreasonable to expect, for example, Nigeria to shut down oil and gas production. It's actually out of the question, or Angola. Uh, so, but what else can they do? Can they recycle waste? Can they reduce energy use through a more eff effective systems? The, the list goes on. It's those sorts of things which are really important. Thank you. I we cannot close the webinar without asking a question about what's going on around us. So Ukraine, how do you see the crisis in Ukraine would impact the energy prices? I have to say, first of all, I can't forecast what's going on in Ukraine. I, I dealt with Mr. Putin so many times. I must have met him I don't know, 20, 30 times when I was with BP, and, and I, I think I'm sensible enough to know that what he's thinking cannot be forecast. Uh, I think that uh, any geopolitical uh, tension tends to, uh, in those sorts of areas, tends to increase the price of oil and gas. But actually, what's really generating these increased prices is a lack of investment. That's what's doing it. The amount of surplus capacity of production of oil is very, very low indeed. And it's only in the hands of Saudi Arabia, and it's not very big. So that's a result of investment. And that means prices probably could stay high for a little while, for a long time. On that rather discouraging note, I'm sorry, I've got to stop. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Lord Brown, for your time. It's a pleasure. Thank you, School of Business and Jean Camel for hosting such an event and they're looking forward to having more of this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.